All right, everybody, we will go ahead and get started. I think it's two o'clock on the dot. So just a little bit of an intro for myself. My name is Meredith Epp. I'm the Industry Partnership Manager here at APCO. Um, I'm really excited today. We have two highly knowledgeable speakers for you. Allison Appleby, who works on our team as the Resource and Programs Coordinator at APCO. Allison is an expert in all things reporting um, and this packaging sustainability framework. So she'll be taking us through how to use your action plan and how to develop a packaging sustainability strategy. We also have Alessia Badero, who is the environment manager from the Iconic. Alessia was a finalist for the APCO Sustainability Champion Award last year, um, and she's been a really influential and key driver in terms of um, driving more sustainability initiatives within her organization, but also in the wider fashion um, sector as well. So welcome to both of you. And I think there's going to be some really interesting discussion later on this afternoon. But before we get started, uh, I just wanted to, to have a bit of a high level view on why uh, sustainability strategy is important, not just a packaging sustainability strategy. Um, and what are some of those reasons why you should do that? So for most of you, I, I hope that you're familiar with the sustainable development goals. So you would have seen these launched um, and these goals go until 2030. Um, and they look at all these different areas. So from number one, from no poverty, number two, no zero hunger, and then moving all the way down to that goal number 17, which is partnerships for the goals. And these have been established through the different um, signatories and nations signed up through the United Nations and agreed to working towards those. Just to note here in Australia, APCO has been charged and is called out in, our, in, a, in the report that goes back to our, how Australia is performing against the sustainable development goals as helping to deliver on this goal number 12 here, which is responsible consumption and production. And so if you're thinking about a place of where to start with developing high level sustainability strategy, I really encourage you to take a look at the sustainable development goals. There's a number of resources out there that can help you um, to get started in working through a sustainability strategy, but they're really clear, really simple goals that can help you on a very high level. And then that all feeds back from a national level up to a global um, level as well. So those are the SDGs, um, but why have a sustainability strategy? So a few things to consider, and um, I know a number of you may have seen the war on waste. Feel free to pop that in the chat box if you've seen it before. Yes, you saw it. there's obviously a thing, especially here in Australia, after the war on waste happened, there was a lot more consumer awareness around sustainability and sustainable packaging um, and just general waste um, overall. So you see here this article, consumers say they want more sustainable products and they have the receipts to prove that. So we see consumers claiming that they would like to have more sustainable products. And, but we also see that they are putting their money where their mouth is. There's some other stats. I think it was Unilever, their sustainable living brands had a 70% growth rate in 2018. So we are seeing those and drivers and increased sales around sustainable brands. So consumers are looking for sustainability, and but we're also seeing this in terms of talent acquisition and, and even in this environment of making sure that the growing workforce really has, an, you know, they want to have values aligned in their workplace. So job seekers target companies putting sustainability into practice. And this is supported by a survey that said, that 65% uh, of people want to work for a sustainable company. So it really is about talent acquisition and also um, talent retention as well. So it's an important pillar that I think every company should really be having. And we're also seeing this being played out um, kind of in more of the financial markets. So investors are looking for ESG, so environmental and social governance funds are outperforming. And we've also heard through members and then and through other institutions as well, that if a company can prove that they have a sustainability plan, being that on your resources, so if that's through the supply chain, 
um, that we have a sustainability plan around that, it can actually help you to lower your rates. So lower loan, loan rates or interest rates from different banks are providing that, especially when you are able to use some kind of verification in terms of create and proving what types of sustainability that you're um, creating there. So a few reasons on why you should have a sustainability strategy. Um, but I'll leave that there on a really high level and I'll go ahead and introduce just the agenda for today. So Alison will be taking us through the details of the APCO action plan, which is due on the 30th of June for all those APCO members out there. And then the key differences between this and a packaging sustainability strategy and some of the, the best practices on developing that strategy as well. Then she'll give us the best practice on using your APCO action plan um, and what to do with that. And then we'll have that really interesting member insight from Alessia over at the Iconic. So without further ado, Alison, I will hand over to you. And if you'd like to start to take us through the APCO action plan. Yeah, definitely. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Alison. I'm the member resource and program coordinator here at APCO. Today, I just wanted to talk to you all briefly about um, packaging sustainability strategy and the APCO action plan. So as part of the member services team, I'm often on the end of phone calls and emails um, with inquiries about what to do or what to use the strategy for or what to use the APCO action plan for and, and how to incorporate them together. So I just wanted to run through them with you today. So the packaging sustainability strategy. For this one, it's really important to know what a strategy can be used for. So for one, it can help ensure that everyone in your organization is aware of your sustainability goals, um, your obligations as an APCO member, and also a signatory to the covenant, and also your commitment to reviewing packaging against the sustainable packaging guidelines. We see it pretty frequently. Um, you might have a key contact who's the APCO contact for an organization, and they leave the company and then you have a new contact that comes on board and, and maybe there isn't a strategy in place that's helping to support them in that process. So by having a strategy there, everyone in the business should really know that the strategy exists and that it, it's um, an important piece to continue working towards. And that's mainly because it can also support with your packaging design decisions. Um, you can use it to share your goals, not only internally, but also externally outside of your organization. And you can use it as a higher level commitment. So with the introduction of the 2025 national packaging targets back in 2018, we've actually seen a number of APCO members who have incorporated into their existing packaging sustainability strategies, their commitment to work towards those. So that's the 100% reusable, recyclable, compostable packaging by 2025, um, the now 50% average recycled content in packaging. Um, so we're starting to see an increase in that in strategies. And an important piece as well is to think about that the packaging sustainability strategy doesn't have to be its own standalone piece. It could be a component of a larger general sustainability strategy where you're looking at other um, aspects as well. As I mentioned before, it's ensuring that action is continued within your company. Um, it isn't a one person job, but it can be a big, um, a big piece to work on. Um, so it's great to have everyone on board. So just moving along here, what it should do uh, so for one it should be approved by a senior management so that really sends a clear message to your employees um, and stakeholders that sustainability is a priority for your organization um, seeing that enthusiasm and approval at a higher level can trickle down into the organization it's important to include that higher level commitment to improve sustainability and environmental performance for your organization's packaging and then also to include um, broader objectives such as, you know, reduction in packaging weight, improved recyclability, use of recycled or renewable materials, um, and that kind of thing as well. So for the APCO action plan and how the packaging sustainability strategy can kind of tie together, you'll see here there's a 13-part criteria. So this criteria, for those of you that are unfamiliar, because I know we have a a fair few non-APCO members who have joined us today. Um, we do have a 13-part reporting criteria, which all of our APCO brand owner members are required to uh, report against. So this is a series of seven uh, core criteria and six uh, recommended criteria. For the very first criteria in this 13-part framework, we have packaging sustainability strategy. 
And it's in this that we're asking companies, you know, do you have a strategy? Is it embedded within your business? Um, do you have uh, goals in there that align with the sustainable packaging guidelines, that kind of thing? And the reason it was set up as the first criteria is because it can have such a flow on effect for all the other criteria. In order to determine packaging material efficiencies and look at recycled content and look at the recoverability of your packaging, it's really important to first have a strategy and plan that you're going to work towards. So having that as the first step, um, especially for any new members who have um, joined us today, for the first report, it can, can be a little bit daunting in, in that you think, oh no, I've, I've written no for every single question. Um, but that's totally fine. It just means you're at the getting started stage. And so having that first criteria about developing a strategy can really help support all of those other criteria. When it comes to the APCO action plan, the way that that works in the reporting tool, which is what both the annual report and the APCO action plan are completed on, it kind of shows how one can inter interrelate with the other. So when you complete your report against these certain criteria, once you submit it, you receive a, a performance summary to say, look, this is how you're performing against each of these criteria. And in that, it provides a suggestion of um, this is how you're going. Great to see you've made these achievements. This is what APCO recommends as a next step for you. So when you're choosing those next steps, I'll show you here. Um, it comes up and says, look, this is where you're at and this is what we recommend as a next step. And what our members have to do is they have to then make a commitment to each of those 13 criteria. So when they choose their time frame for the APCO action plan, um, it can be either one, two or three years which is the time frame of which they're going to work towards these commitments that they're selecting for each of those 13 criteria. But at the same time, it's something that still needs to be revisited each year. So because the APCO annual report and action plan are annual obligations uh, for our brand owner members, we do ask you to revisit because something might change. There might be a decision in the organisation to say, look, we're actually going to change the pathway that we're working towards. We were committing to this level now. Um, for the moment, we're just wanting to stay where we're at and focus on another piece. Um, and so you've got that flexibility there as well. So you're selecting a, a commitment level for each of those 13 criteria. And that's what develops the annual report and action plan document. So this is a really important piece for our members and also for ATCO. So in the Australian Packaging Covenant, um, which is uh, you know, an important document that APCO is the entity in charge of administering. Um, all of the signatories or APCO brand owner members um, to the covenant are required to post their annual report and action plan on their website. And at the same time, APCO is also obligated to post our members' annual report and action plans on our website as well. So what happens is when you submit your APCO action plan, that then develops the annual report and action plan document. And so this is the public facing piece. And so this is a really important um, part, similar to how a packaging sustainability strategy works in that it's emphasizing the importance of showing and publicly committing towards pieces and, and showing ongoing improvement over time. Um, and so I'll just jump in now to show you. So using your APCO action plan, making it public. So like I said, APCO posted on their website, uh, on our website, <laughs> and members are supposed to post it on their own as well. And that's that covenant obligation of publishing your action plan and your reports on your website in a prominent and readily identifiable way. A lot of the times, members will put this on their sustainability pages. Um, some have packaging specific pages as well that they'll um, include that on. And it just shows that, look, as a company, we're, we've made this decision to work towards these pieces um, and, and where you're going as your next steps. But now that you've developed your APCO action plan, um, what's the next step? What, what do you do with this? So the next step then is to create a detailed internal plan. So you do have to post, for the APCO members who have joined us today, you do have to post um, that document on your website and we post on our own. Um, but at the same time, it's then the next step is creating a more detailed plan. So you said, for example, for that first criteria, a packaging sustainability strategy, maybe in your first report, you don't have a strategy. And so in your APCO action plan, you then said, okay, our, our commitment is to develop a strategy. Um, and so that's a really high level commitment. What you then want to do is then say, okay, let's break it down. Let's break down the actions of what's required to 
you know, meet that commitment. We've got to determine who in the organisation needs to be involved in developing the piece. Maybe it needs to go for approvals to different management. Maybe it has to go up to the board for approval. Um, you want to then determine each of those roles um, that require that support each of those actions and also setting timeframes for them as well. Um, it's really important to keep um, those actions and timeframes in line with uh, the action plan uh, commitment um, so that you can continue improvement in that area. And then the next step, uh, which is also really important, is the idea of working through your actions but also tracking your progress. So those, those smaller actions that you're working towards, um, it's really important to keep that in back of mind. So like I said, the annual report and the action plan uh, are quite closely interrelated. Um, because what you do in your annual report can inform next steps for you in your action plan. But then it then kind of loops back in and says, oh, this is what we've committed to. We've committed to a strategy. And then over the year, you might develop that strategy and have that in place. And when it comes to your next APCO annual report, you're then saying, okay, we've actually achieved this development. We've made this strategy. It's in place now. It's embedded within the business. And you can report on that. But it's really important to keep evidence to support that um, for those of you that are APCO members, you'll know when you do your annual report that there is an evidence box um, and that supports not only members, but it also supports um, for the audit process as well. So when you do have um, an audit process and you're, you're a part of the, the APCO uh, verification audit, which happens each year, a random uh, number of members are selected each year. It's randomly selected um, and they have to provide the evidence to say, this is, this is what the evidence is to support what we've made as claims in our APCO annual report. And so keeping track of that in a, a database and having it all really clear makes that process easier each year as you do your APCO annual report. Like I said before, it's, it's not a one-person job. Um, it can be a, a bigger piece. It's easier to have, have support and help. Um, so having it in a place where everyone can access that um, and then maybe you're on holiday next year and someone else is taking on the, the role themselves and having that evidence and and uh, support to back them up is really important too. Now I'm just conscious of time um, and we do have a lot to get to but if you do have any questions please feel free to pop them in the chat box. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end and if we can't get to anything we will then um, have a, a, a follow-up with emails. I just wanted to pass on now to uh, Alessia. So Alessia is the environment manager at the Iconic. Uh, the Iconic became members I believe back in 2018 um, and so uh, I would like to pass over to Alessia now so that she can speak from a member's perspective of the importance of having a strategy and an action plan. So Alessia, over to you. Yeah. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. So um, thank you, Alison, for the introduction and Meredith, just before her, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Environment Manager at the Iconic um, and um, I've been working in the fashion um, sector for all my working career really and I've been consulting businesses on how to be more sustainable uh, in their operation and um, supply chain and so today I'm just going to talk you through um, a little bit uh, a part of our journey towards uh, incorporating uh, more sustainable packaging um, in our business so just a bit of an intro for um, who doesn't know who the Iconic is. So we are the leading and fastest uh, growing um, fashion, sports and kids uh, online retailer in Australia and New Zealand. Um, we've got something like 150 million visits on our website annually. Um, we've got a very good and seamless um, uh, delivery options um, and uh, access, give access to our customers uh, to over a thousand brands. Uh, and yeah, so our purpose um, in whatever we do um, is uh, liberation um, and we really want um, uh, everyone or our customers to be able to express the best version of themselves and we do our, um, we are very aware of um, our also the environment you live in plays a key role um, in how you can be the best version of you and so we really want um, to preserve it and uh, make, book, make good for the environment and our communities um, in doing our business. Um, so next slide. Um, so yeah, so this is just an overview. I sort of give an overview of our strategy. Um, our first strategy uh, started in 2018 uh, and we have a new one now taking us to 2022. Uh, we've got three main pillars to this strategy, ethical sourcing, environment and community. 
Um, yeah, so just want to give you um, a very quick walk through what are the activities we're doing in these three areas. Um, so ethical sourcing is anything has to do with our supply chain. Um, so we've got um, a big piece of work going on on factory and workers training, although with COVID it's become uh, much, much harder because um, we can't do a face-to-face, -face, so it has to be um, through Zoom or webinars. Um, so the other thing we're doing, we want to know a little bit better our materials and make sure we do use materials that are a bit less impactful on the environment. Um, and also we want to get a bit more visibility on um, our supply chain uh, beyond Tier 1. Um, in terms of environment, um, a lot going on here, and this is anything that um, regards um, and affects our own operations. Um, so uh, we want to obviously reduce our packaging footprint, uh, but we also want to explore more sustainable delivery option, lower our carbon emission, and um, there's a few pieces of work around uh, textile donation and diversion from um, landfill of those textile as well. In terms of uh, community, um, so this is about how we um, um, how we um, face and how we interact with our community uh, that we impact onto and we operate in. Um, so we've got um, uh, some work around um, understanding what it means for us to become a B Corp, but also uh, we're looking at our first reconciliation action plan this year um, and a lot of um, effort on uh, more volunteering and fundraising events to support our charity partner. So this was the overview um, of uh, what we're doing in general. Um, and um, our strategy um, uh, for, for the first time this year is supported by targets. Um, we've got quite a few, um, we go up to 16 different targets and five of those are dedicated specifically um, uh, to packaging. Um, so the first, um, we've uh, identified the three big, big groups um, in terms of what we're trying to do. Uh, with the packaging piece. Um, so one is around materials and efficiency, um, and we want to use uh, more recycled content in our packaging for both plastic, uh, so poly bags, um, and our carbon and paper. Um, and we're also aiming at having 100% recycled content for our shipping packaging as well. Um, we have uh, a recyclability uh, target. Um, we want to make sure that everything we send into the market um, through uh, our business um, is fully recyclable in Australia. Um, and the last target is, a, is around consumer education. Um, so this is um, the um, communication we want to incorporate on the packaging um, around proper disposal or recyclability. And so this is just um, an overview of what I'm going to talk to you through today. Um, and um, so the packaging journey for us um, started uh, with the packaging mapping, but then uh, divided into different streams. So um, the supply packaging and shipping inventory packaging. And so I'm just going to focus today on what we've been doing around the packaging, the supply packaging stream uh, with our private labels. Um, so in terms of um, the first step that we undertook um, in our journey was the packaging mapping. Um, so we tried to approach this um, looking at the product flow um, that we have at the Econic. Um, so we have two main categories um, of products, if you want, that we have on our website. Um, so from an operation perspective, uh, we've got some indent product or also a wholesale um, product as well. Um, and um, uh, we have also the marketplace uh, products, which we don't own ourselves, uh, but and they're also shipped directly from our marketplace um, customer marketplace suppliers. Um, the three typology of packaging we identified is supplier packaging, inventory packaging, and shipping packaging. Uh, the last two we have a direct um, leverage on and we do purchase them directly. Uh, whether the supplier packaging, um, we still have leverage, but we don't have that purchased uh, lever that we, would ha we have with the other two. Um, and we did also do in this piece some sort of higher level analysis just to understand what were the components um, uh, of the packaging that we had in each different stage. The second step then um, was for, for us to build on the learnings and findings um, from that first mapping. Uh, we built our first um, packaging strategy. Um, and to do that, um, we really had to um, look at the overall 
uh, analysis and mapping exercise and try to define priorities and how we did that. Um, we did obviously uh, focus on volumes um, on, of the packaging uh, in the different components, uh, but we also looked at what was um, uh, important and, and had a bigger resonance uh, with our customers and our employees as well. Um, we did also identify some low hanging fruits that were pretty um, uh, uh, pretty easy to achieve for us um, and so uh, really important as well to incorporate um, in the strategy. Um, and in this at this stage, I think um, also I have to say the APCO program and the resources um, of the member centre were really um, helpful for us um, to help us build that framework and guide us through, um, through how we could build our strategy. Um, and then after building the strategy, we obviously also build a plan to try implement it um, uh, within the business and identify the key um, stakeholders that we had to engage um, with. Um, and yeah, that's a tip here. Um, we, we found it much more easier um, to uh, in the prioritizing um, exercise to focus on what we could control first um, and get some good wins from there and then expand our, our scope from there. Um, in terms of step three, um, after building the strategy, um, we wanted a way to uh, share this strategy, uh, a, more, a bit of a more powerful way to share this strategy within our supply chain. Um, so that's why um, we build the sustainable packaging guidelines. Um, and to build this, um, this basically give an overview to our suppliers of what we define as sustainable packaging and what is sustainable packaging for us um, and um, uh, we drew a lot of information from the up to the up course sustainable packaging guideline but just tailored uh, a little bit more to our business um, focusing on the type um, of principles and the principles that are there that are more um, are suited for our business uh, and they're more applicable um, as well uh, these guidelines were sent to all our suppliers, uh, private labels, so our own brands uh, as well as branded, so uh, not our own brands. Um, and uh, these were um, the starting point for the next steps, uh, which was for us the packaging reviews. After um, issuing the sustainable uh, packaging guidelines, we really um, um, uh, find out that we wanted to know uh, more about the current packaging. We had some ideas, we had a conversation with some of our suppliers, but we wanted to have uh, more specific and accurate information. Um, uh, so we selected um, our, uh, all our suppliers and we sent over um, a packaging reviews um, uh, request. Um, this was done through an Excel spreadsheet and, and we asked um, all um, uh, a list of different information uh, including the material they use for each packaging component, um, information around dimension of those packaging components and weight, um, the presence of environmental claims on the packaging, and also whether or not um, um, the materials had the recycle content and if that was um, certified or not. Uh, this really helped us. Um, the process lasted, I think, about um, three or four months overall between uh, the time that we sent the first, uh, they sent the reviews out and when we actually managed to get uh, all the information back. So there was a little bit of back and forth with the suppliers also to explain to them um, what type of information we were asking for, our supply chain. Um, is largely located in China, India and Bangladesh. So especially for Chinese uh, suppliers, we found that was a little bit of a language barrier as well to overcome there. Um, and this was really helpful for us uh, to um, understand more our packaging. So we got a lot more information than we had before. And this was also useful for our annual reporting, um, APCO reporting. So having more information on dimension and weight made easier uh, to make those calculation um, when it, when um, we had to do our report. Um, the other thing that this exercise helped us um, establish and identified is uh, the packaging targets that we now have um, uh, as part of our strategy. Um, so we made the targets in a way that, that we thought we, um, uh, it was achievable for our supply chain, uh, but still remained challenging um, for us uh, to get there.
uh, step number five uh, in our journey. Um, after issuing the packaging targets, uh, we uh, wanted to, to be more specific, uh, especially with our private label supplier around what was requested from them um, in the packaging, uh, from a packaging perspective. Um, and so um, we build a sustainable packaging requirement uh, where we outline uh, the requests that we have from our end um, on the packaging uh, that is used for our private labels. And this, is, it, this includes a minimum uh, recycle content for each different component um, and include um, the verification standard, standard as a reference for that recycle content um, that we're aiming at. Um, we also have a conformance to this packaging requirement uh, that is mandatory um, within um, 16 months uh, from when they were issued. Um, and we will also be referencing the requirements within the contract with those suppliers um, when as they get reviewed. Um, the last step um, uh, was issuing the requirements and then um, making sure we could um, keep track on how we um, performing against these requirements and the target and this is really uh, a step that we are in now and um, so there's still a, a lot of learnings in that uh, but what we have done so far is is we have engaged um, starting with the biggest suppliers we have engaged them in one-to-one -one conversation um, just to um, share with them um, the requirements and then talk them through the requirements and self understanding what were the biggest barriers they find um, in going through um, these different requests um, and how we could help them overcome them. Um, then in terms of learnings, um, yeah, so we have still a lot, a lot to learn um, in this space. Um, but what I can tell you so far that we have found is that um, sometimes for some of our suppliers, um, understanding the packaging sustainability and how to interpret packaging sustainability was difficult for them to understand. Um, another thing is that um, whereas uh, from some perspective, uh, material sustainability um, is a pretty straightforward concept uh, to, um, to understand. On the other hand, the disposal um, is a little bit more complicated uh, and disposal or recovery of packaging is very often different in different countries um, and our suppliers obviously uh, have, have a very wide range of cast of clients. Uh, we are not the only one and other clients might be asking different things in terms of packaging. Um, so we really have to make sure that uh, we explain the old story behind our requirements and why we're asking specific things. And so I think um, down the line, training and engagement will be really fundamental um, to get us through um, and reach, to reach our targets for 2022. So that's it for me. Um, I hope this has been insightful and also um, that my connection has not dropped, but I can't see um, any red flags in the comments. So it should be good. Oh, that was great. Thank you, Alessia. And thank you, Alison. I think both really insightful presentations and we've got questions coming through from all over the shop. Um, so, Alessia, I might start with you just as um, we're on that train of thought at the moment. Um, so one for you, Alessia, is around when you're completing the packaging reviews, do you have any recommendations for how best to store this data? I think some members might struggle with that. Is it Excel sheets? Um, do you guys have a system? Any recommendations? Um, at the moment, we're, lo we're working on Excel sheets and I did um, send out um, some uh, requests to our tech team really to build something a little bit more uh, technological for us. Uh, but, you know, and I imagine for everyone else is the same. Our tech team is always super busy. So, yes, uh, the answer is yes, uh, through uh, Excel spreadsheet, a lot of um, calculations, a spreadsheet as well. Um, but uh, down the line, ideally, we would have a software that stores all the packaging information against each supplier. So that's what we're aiming at. Fantastic. And just kind of on that same vein, um, Alessia, do you have any tips for how you interact with your suppliers? And maybe what's been some of the feedback that you've had from suppliers going through the SPRs? Um, so the feedback is was generally positive. Um, I feel um, from my experience, um, sometimes in some respects, some of our suppliers needed a little bit more uh, specific 
um, a request from us, whereas before uh, we were we were very high level uh, trying to um, just explain what packaging sustainability was in general. Now that we have the requirements, they have a, a, they have some guidelines, they have some point to follow and some things to comply with. So um, that was well received. Um, another feedback that I had from them, and this is the barrier that we've been trying to overcome uh, for a while now, um, that sometimes a misinterpretation uh, between recycled content um, and recyclability. Um, and I have to go through this every time with all suppliers, um, and even if the requirements are, and also the um, packaging reviews sheets were all translated in Mandarin. Um, that doesn't seem to make a big difference. Um, so, yeah, some concepts are um, still, um, uh, we have to work on them um, more, uh, but also during the supplier training conferences that we have um, every year, we always touch base on packaging and we always reiterate the message and just uh, give an overview of the key, prints, key concepts around packaging. Um, uh, to make um, uh, really clarity around recyclability, recycle content, renewable material, etc. No, that's a great one. I think we're seeing some agreement here in the chat box, um, and I know that that's one that trips members up quite often as well. Um, just another one for you, Alessia, too, is how long did it take you to create your sustainability strategy? Huh. Okay. Um, so it, I think it took about three months overall. Um, there was a lot of uh, very intense work at the beginning um, to create this strategy, uh, draft it, review it with my internal team. Uh, but then we also did uh, run a couple of workshop um, with the key stakeholders um, engaged in the uh, packaging journey, if you want to call it. Um, it's definitely a journey. Um, and so we validated uh, what we, our assumptions were with those stakeholders um, and then um, we incorporated the packaging strategy into the bigger sustainability strategy and got the validation from the executives. So I would say around about three months overall. Uh, but then we had a very strong deadline um, coming from the release of the new strategy. So we already knew that we were going to do that. So I think things were uh, speed up a little bit uh, because uh, of that deadline. No, that's very helpful. Um, all right, we've got another question here. Um, Alessia, lots for you around. <laughs> um, I think everyone's really curious to understand how you work with suppliers and it sounds like you've got a good program going. Um, how do you, uh, any advice on how to ensure that you're receiving accurate data from suppliers? Ah, that's a very that's a very good question. Um, sometimes when we ask ask things um, in different moments, uh, we might have slightly different responses. So uh, the important thing is um, keeping following up with them. We have a quarterly reporting going on, so um, I'm able to track whether the information were different and check back with them why things um, uh, were reported in a different way. Uh, sometimes it's just a mistake. Uh, and um, some other times um, uh, is uh, maybe a bit, bit of distraction um, during completing um, those reporting. But what we also have um, is, um, uh, I don't know if uh, you know, but we are part of a bigger uh, group. Uh, it's an international group uh, called Global, Global Fashion Group. Um, so under this group, there's the Iconic, but there's also other brands that do similar business to ours. So online retailers may mainly focus on apparel and accessories um, in different parts uh, of the world. Uh, now, one of our sister company is Alora, um, and they have um, quite a few people that uh, can fluently speak uh, Mandarin. Um, and we also have uh, some sustainability people um, in the um, uh, GFG team uh, that are based um, uh, within um, China, in China, in Asia. So um, we do work really closely with them uh, to try and get the message across um, and help with, uh, with the translation and try to minimize the error there. Yeah, well, that's great. I think um, that definitely helps. It sounds like having the whole team on board and that there's a lot of internal communication seems to really be helping yeah. to, to get the strategy across. All right, I might pivot, um, Alison, and just a question here for you, um, knowing that some people might be joining us for the first time here. 
Can you just give us uh, the explanation and the difference between recyclability and recycled content? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so like Alessia said, this is one that can often get a bit confused. Um, and we do see that in the annual reports as well. Um, sometimes there's a bit of confusion there. So the difference between recyclability and recycled content. So recyclability is looking at if something can be recycled, it can be sent through a MRF and, and be recycled that way. Whereas recycled content is looking, the, looking at the output of that and incorporating that back into packaging or into products. So recycled content is what is within material. It's material that has been recovered and is now being incorporated back into packaging. Um, whereas recyclability is its ability to be recycled. Good definitions and good explanations there. Um, Alison, another question that's come through to you um, is, what happens if we don't achieve my APCO action plan commitments in the time frame we selected? What should I do? It's a great question. Um, so as I said before, when you're setting your action plan, um, you do have, a cho have to choose a time frame of one, two or three years. Um, and, and it is, you know, it, things happen. You might have a change in, in the direction of the company and, and what you're focusing on. Um, and that's again, why we get our members to revisit that action plan every year. It's so that you have the opportunity to amend those responses each year. So ideally, you're continuing to progress for each of those criteria year on year. Um, but we understand that at some points it might hit a point where you're going, okay, I can't go any further or I can't quite reach that target. But that's also a great time to come to us, um, the APCO team and the member services team to say, look, I'm really stuck on this one. I don't know what to do as a next step. Are there any resources to support? Um, or do you know of anyone that we can get in touch with that's done something similar? Um, we're always happy. And I, again, a lot of what we do at APCO is quite collaborative. Uh, so if we are aware of a member doing one thing and another member's struggling to try and, and reach that point as well, we can look at getting them connected and, and speaking with one another in order to make that change. Um, but don't worry too much. Uh, the main concern, I guess, is if we see, you know, a member kind of plateau and they're just remaining still um, over a certain period of time, so over a couple of years, if we see no kind of improvement, generally, again, that's a, ch a case where we'll get in touch and say, hey, um, is something going wrong? Is there something we can support with? Um, and one more for you, Alison. Where on my website should I put my annual report and action plan document? Um, in terms of the uh, APCO annual report and action plan document, I think I mentioned it earlier, but a great place is on a uh, sustainability component of the website. If you have a packaging specific one, it's always great. You can post you know, your APCO member logo for those that are members with us today. Um, maybe if you have a public packaging sustainability strategy, you can share that as well along with that annual report and action plan document. Um, Alessia, from a member's perspective, are you um, able to say whereabouts on your website you can find that information on your own? Yeah, so um, we have a we have launched last year a dedicated web uh, packaging page. So we have a sustainability section, and there's all the pillars, and within the environment section that is specifically linked to a packaging page. What just we just have more information about you know how to recycle your packaging, what is it made of, um, and at the bottom we also have um, information around what are we doing next um, around packaging um, and our commitment to the up to the upco. Um, and there we linked um, our, um, on the report and action plan. Yeah, and that's a great place to um, to pop all that information. And it's um, quite intuitive for, for someone who's looking for yeah. information to pop on their website. And, and Beforehand, when we didn't have the packaging page, um, it was in still in our environment section anyway. Um, Leslie, I have another question for you. It seems like we've talked a lot about internal communications and, and getting the team on board. Um, can you just maybe give us some tips on you know, maybe working with marketing or working with senior management on how that's gone for you and what are some best practices in terms of working with different teams within the business? Um, I think the, the best tip I can give is just um, make them aware of why we, we're going on, on this journey. Um, so um, I found that many of the executives um, internally um, they're, they're big uh, supporters of sustainability in general, uh, but when it comes to packaging, um, not all of them were aware um, of the difficulties in the recycling process, the limitation we have um, here in Australia, different programs that are available to customers, or again, re recycle content. 
um, benefits um, in the packaging. So really probably try to bring them with you in the journey. So really explaining the why and give it them a bit more context. They will become um, your best supporters. Um, in terms of marketing, uh, that's interesting you mentioned. Um, there's a very key stakeholder to engage, um, especially I find that every time I'm discussing a new packaging component or transitioning from one material to another, um, then it's always a good time for the marketing team uh, to look at refreshing um, the look of things. Um, so uh, very important to uh, get them um, uh, early in the journey so they can have their say and... Um, um, they can also uh, provide some interesting inputs um, and back up um, any new options that you put forward. Fantastic. Um, that's a really great example. Um, and then I guess just following up on that a little bit, Alessia, is you talked earlier about um, the consumers and, and how you prioritize some of maybe what that low hanging fruit or some of that packaging that you found was important to consumers. Yeah. And when you were developing the strategy, how did you understand what was important to consumers? And then can you share a little bit about what some of those items might be? Um, so when we, um, for our customers, when we ship our orders, uh, very often we send out a survey. Um, and these surveys, um, this survey also has um, um, an experience component to it. Um, and we had a lot of comments actually around packaging throughout the years. So that's why we know it was really important for um, for our customers um, and so especially the shipping packaging um, and that was also when we developed our first strategy um, in 2018 um, we wanted to understand which were the different areas we were, wanted to focus on and um, internally so from an employee's perspective we ran um, uh, we run I think 10 different working groups trying to bring all the different part of the business um, together uh, to, to, to have their say um, and most of them um, were really concerned about the packaging and really wanted us to change it um, and find uh, some better options. Um, so uh, that was a pretty clear, um, clear message. And also we get um, feedback on the packaging and requests um, pretty often, I would have to say, during the survey. So uh, is a trend that we've been seeing for a while. Yeah, that's fantastic. One more here, Alessia, for you. So what approval criteria do you use when considering new ideas or sustainability projects? Given that typically cost is a first consideration, any ideas can be disregarded for projects requiring significant investment? Mm -hmm. huh. the, yeah, that's a broader question. It, it, it's a really good one. Um, yes, cost is... <laughs> Is really really important, um, and um, is always um, a, a fundamental part of your approval process. And um, we do very often build um, business model or business cases around uh, how a determined initiative um, can provide um, a positive impact. Um, also, considering um, despite considering the initial investment. And uh, sometimes it's very long term. Um, you have to look uh, very long term. Um, the other thing, the other driver we have is because we have a strategy and we have some targets and they have a specific deadline. Um, so time, sometimes that, because it's a public commitment, can also justify or make it a little bit easier for you to get across the line some specific project, even projects, even if they um, cost more money than what we initially planned or that what you uh, will like to and sometimes uh, we do also um, do more research sometimes things um, um, are not um, um, as straightforward as you think so you might have other solutions out there in the market that, that don't end up costing you less money or you know different models that you haven't thought about so there's a lot of research and um, the project working group that we have in you know in the different um, sustainability areas they're all very engaged so sometimes they come up with um, ideas or things they've heard or things they've read um, somewhere um, and just give us um, quite good tips um, as well and so sometimes it's about changing the approach a little bit to get the same result uh, a bit trying to be a bit more creative but yes definitely we had some stops um, around our projects for a cost perspective or delays as well so 
Perfect. No, I think that's really important. And and touching on kind of that wider, it sounds like internally there's a really great diverse group. But I know that you participate in a number of other forums and have other partnerships and things like that as well. You can kind of have those ideas that bounce off in other groups that you participate in as well. Yeah. Right. Um, Alison, a couple of quick questions for you. So one I think um, I know the answer to. Uh, which is, if I have any other questions, what is the best way to get in touch with the APCO team? Uh, well, you can always email us at uh, memberservices at packagingcovenant.org.au or um, give any one of us a, a call on the phone number as well. We're always happy to have a chat. Um, but Alison, this other question is around um, the SPG, is around what support does APCO provide? Um, for getting packaging to suppliers to comply with the SPGs. So does APCO provide support for getting packaging suppliers to comply with the SPGs? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's such an important piece, uh, kind of like Alessia was saying during her presentation about communicating to suppliers uh, your goals and your commitments that you're working towards. If you've got a strategy, sharing the strategy with them to say, look, as a company, this is what we're working towards. Specifically for the SPGs, uh, that's a really important one. The SPGs are a public document, um, so you're welcome to share the document um, with your suppliers. We are looking at potentially having them translated into different languages so that you can share it internationally for any international suppliers where English might not be their first language. Um, but it's really important to think about uh, the best way to communicate it and, and what's best for your company. So there are 10 principles as a part of the sustainable packaging guidelines. Um, it's important to make sure that they're fit for purpose for your company to say, look, these are the ones we're really focusing towards um, and communicating that, including it in uh, processes, uh, new development processes as well, procurement documents, saying, look, as a part of the procurement of this, of this item, we'd also like to know this information about our packaging too um, is a great way to get information. Um, and always feel free if you're wanting to, say if you have a head office maybe, that you're wanting to communicate to maybe overseas, uh, if you want to get in touch with the member services team, we can always pop together an email that you're welcome to then share on with them, explaining you know why you're an APCO member and the importance of the SPGs and how to use them as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Alison. I think we'll leave it there, actually. So those have been some great questions. Alessia and Alison, thank you so much for your brilliant responses and for your thoughtful presentations. It's always a pleasure listening to both of you. Um, I think we'll just pop on to the next slide and I think we do have a poll. Um, so before everyone hops off, we'd love it if you can participate in the poll and um, those questions there. And next week we do encourage you to join us. Uh, our weekly webinar is on promoting your green credentials. Uh, we'll be having Alice Johnson, who's from Horizon Communications Group myself, and then also uh, Graz, who is the CEO of the Banksia Foundation, sharing some more insights on to how do you talk about all of this great work now that you've done your sustainability strategy, how do you communicate that out to customers? So thank you again to Alessia and to Allison for coming along and for your participation today. And we hope to see all of you again next week. If we didn't get to your questions today, the team will follow those up, or again, feel free to contact us at APCO at packagingcovenant.org.au. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thank have you. Bye, everyone.